I can do the intro. We are live. Hello. Ken, how are you? Uh, we are live from Circle Our Ranch here in beautiful Toledo, Ohio. Sunny and beautiful. With uh, Mr. Ken Haas. And we got Mike from Eastwood Guitars here. Take it away. Thanks, John. Thanks for uh, working with us back here today in the absence of Jeff again. Boy, I, I can't get anybody to stick, can I? Behind the camera back there. Hey, Penny did it for a really long time, and then she gave up on me. Well, you just have to press start, and then yeah. you can leave. I guess. Yeah. I guess. No, we're going to get some close-ups <laughs> and stuff today. Um, right. So today is uh, Hoser Day. We That's already right. decided. Um, Mike is down from the Great White North. Uh, are you a Toronto native? Is that where yeah. you're originally from? Yeah, kind of born in Montreal, grew up in Toronto. Um, but I'm actually, I've, I've, I've been out of the country for almost six months. So that's I'm on why, my way back from Arizona. So that's why your accent's completely gone. That's right. Okay. I'll be back in Toronto tomorrow, eh? Do you speak French? Uh, no. Grow, growing up in Montreal? How'd no. you grow up in Montreal and not speak French? I left by the time I was kind of 11. Okay. Yeah. That's a big thing up there. I don't know it if is. you knew that or not. It is a thing. It's Oh, it's a thing. It is, it is a thing. It's a thing that people are thing. very kinda, serious about. It depends where what neighborhood you grew up in. Okay. So, yeah. Have you ever been to the Montreal Grand Prix? No, I have not. What the hell? I did go to Expo 67. What kind of Canadian That's kind of you? dating me, isn't it? 67? That's, yeah. I, was, I was already walking by then. That was, that was two years before I was born. Yeah. Yeah. That was a big deal, Expo 67. Yeah? You probably didn't even know it. No, it, uh, I mean, I, I, no, I've seen the t-shirt. Yeah. But I mean, outside of that, I don't have much of yeah. a feel. I don't have very many memories. Was that like a World's uh, Fair thing? Or? It was the World's Fair, yeah. Yeah. What, we're having, it's getting off to a weird start today. I yes. like it. I like yeah. it a lot. Yeah. Believe it or not, we're here to talk about guitars, I swear. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I'm fascinated with Canadians because of my uh, utter and complete fascination with the tragedy of the hip. Yes. And so I, uh, anytime funny. I meet a Canadian, I will talk about the tragedy of the hip. And one of the first things that yeah. they always say to me is, how do you know about that? Yeah. And of course, we got Canadian radio here in Toledo and Detroit. Of course, yeah. From, so they would have been Windsor. a big thing here. And so... And they they would play big shows here, yeah. and and then you get a couple hours south of us here, and yeah. they would be playing at clubs even at the height of their powers in, yeah. in Canada. So they were a fun band to follow for sure. It's an American weird weird note on that. Yeah, um, I left Canada in 1990, 1990 and came back in two thousand and two, and that was basically the tragically hip time. Yeah, so I kind of didn't big... even know anything about them. Well, yeah, as a Canadian, I'm one of the few Canadians that have not. But I kind of grew to like them after I came back. So. And we're, so, we're, so that's, what we're, that's where we're headed. Where were you in that time? The, the, the question that I have for you, and I know a little bit of this, but I think people tuning in that want to hear about you mm -hmm. and your business, how did you get started in this business? What brought you to the States back in the day, and how did you end up where you are now? Go. No so, pressure. Okay. Um, my background was in electronic design automation. Print and circuit board design. That's what I kind of, in late 20s, I kind of started doing that for a living. And that led me to... And that um, would have been when? In the 80s? Uh, yeah, Mid-80s, I started doing that. Okay. Late 80s, we started a company up in Toronto that... Um, I was one of the first guys in Canada that, that stopped doing that activity on a draft, drafting board and started doing it on a computer. Okay. And then so there were only about three or four companies that were making that software... I ended up evolving into sales of that because they needed somebody to show it to other people. We started a company doing that, uh, selling and distributing software for printed circuit board design. Okay. We ended up buying our competitor in California. So I'm going quick. Yeah, we, well, you all, have of to sudden, go quick. Okay. all of a sudden, we're in California in the early 90s. And um, that was my whole thing. I had nothing to do with guitars. I, I loved guitars. I, I had record collection, the massive record collection. Ever since, I was buying records since I was 12 years old. So did, did you play in bands and stuff at that time? Played, played in bands um, from here and there, but it was never kind of the, the main thing. By the time we were in California, we had the, the kind of band that you'd play on a, on a Tuesday night when they had five bands in one lousy club because all their friends, and that's the only way they could sell the booze at the bar. That was the thing down in uh, Boy, I'm San glad, Jose. Boy, I'm glad that's changed. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> exactly. So, but anyhow, I, I through that process, um, I started collecting weird, funky. I had a fascination with most right guitars, anything that was made in Japan back in the sixties and seventies, pawn shop stuff. You know, with more knobs and pickups, the better. And I would, uh, I'd spend my weekends uh, 
trawling around pawn shops in the Bay Area, buying up this stuff, okay. bringing it home, taking the guitar apart, trying to figure out how they worked, cleaning them up. And a thing called eBay started around 1995. Like it was, it was a while ago. Yeah. And I started. Yeah, but I mean, eBay was there like as soon as people started generally having internet access, as it, be, as it started to become it a was, thing. That was the very early days. It was, yeah. yeah. And eBay was there like right at the start of all of that. Yeah. 95. So, Jesus, that, it doesn't seem possible that that was. Yeah. Going on 30 years ago. Well, this the blogs didn't exist. None right, of that right, stuff right. existed. No, of so, course. But I was a salesman. I was selling software. And it was a, as a hobby, I thought, well, I'm going to buy and sell guitars. Yeah. So I started this website called My Rare Guitars. And that was in 1997. So wow. that's a long time ago. That's and all I would ago. do was I would basically, um, it, I guess you'd call it a blog, but I would buy these guitars in pawn shops take them home, take them apart, photograph them all, clean them up, write a little story about it. Here's this Japanese um, kawaii moon salt, such and such, two okay. volume, three, yada, yada, take some pictures, and I'd put it on eBay for $399 after buying it for $50 in a pawn shop. Okay. And it was just for giggles. But I, I just kept doing it. It was kind of a fun thing to do. Uh, as that kind of progressed in a or maybe around 97, uh, we sold the software company to a company up in Portland, Oregon called ORCAD. And part of that deal was I had, because all the employees in my company had to transfer over to them and I had to stay there for about five years was the deal. Okay. At that time, I, I kind of turned up the jets on the, on the guitar stuff. And I ended up um, becoming a dealer for Burns Guitars um, with Chris DePinto. That would have been probably really late 90s. Um, That's there was so a, funny. I, I see Chris. You remember Chris? Yeah. I, I know seen Chris. Him yeah. yeah. Of course. Um, <coughs> what was he, 12? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, right? Because, I mean, he doesn't. Yeah. I mean, I guess he and Chris and I are probably yeah. about the same age. I would think he'd be 50s. about 10 years younger than me. Yeah. 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 And then there was a company in um, Italy, Echo, EKO. Yeah, of course. Um, and, so, and I managed to become the North <laughs> American me. distributor for that brand. Through My Rare Guitars? Yeah, everything was going through My Rare Guitars. Selling online? Selling online only. So okay. I bought, basically I bought just 60 guitars from the guys in Italy. They shipped them over. My wife and I shoved them in the, pulled the cars out of the garage, put them in the garage, <laughs> took pictures of everything and just started selling them. Uh, so that was just kind of fun. Eventually, the the the, the software business, the the um, the sale of that finished, and I kind of we were wondering what to do with our lives, sitting in the middle of California, and um, the September 11th thing hit, and we can all remember where we were when that hit. Of course. And at the same time, my wife's uh, parents were hit, health was going down. You know, they were back in Toronto, so we thought, you know what, let's just pack everything up and move back to Toronto and figure out where life goes from here. And um, that winter, I went to the NAMM show, and I um, walked around. I think I had an original Mosrite with me. And I was shopping it around to all the guys in China and Korea and whatnot. Can you make this? Can you make this? And one factory said, yeah, I can do that. Minimum order is a, a full 20-foot container. So what are you going to do? So I said, okay, I'll make this Mosrite. And I came up with about maybe 20 different models four or five colors each, and went back to the hotel room and wrote down on paper a purchase order. Didn't have know what the company name was. And I, that night, there was like a Clint Eastwood movie marathon on the TV. Oh my God, that's hilarious. <laughs> and so I just wrote Eastwood Guitars just for something to do as a placeholder. Went and gave them a PO the next morning. And then we'd moved back to Canada in, in uh, June, I think, and the container arrived in July. At our house, with a 20 foot container back up the driveway. Six yeah. months later. Yeah, that was the start of it all. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, <laughs> it was quite funny because all the kids in the neighborhood, I think I was going around saying, who wants to make $20? Oh, it's, oh your mic's giving off? a shit. John's coming in. The beauty of live TV. Gotta love it. Gotta love it. We should just replace that pack. I'm thinking. That's I don't know. I mean, or maybe it's a, I don't 
I don't know. And then it wor- and then it works fine for months, and then it gives us the same Can you amount hear me of now? shit. Seems better. Okay. So what did we miss? Do I go all the way back to the start? Stop. Read. I was I was born in Lachine, Quebec. <laughs> Anyhow, let's go back to. So you brought over you brought over a twenty foot container full of Mosrites. Yes. Well, at various different models, but yeah. I was going around um, all the kids in the neighborhoods, like, okay. Man, here's twenty bucks, twenty bucks, twenty bucks. Help us unload this stuff, and we were we were shoving guitars in the basement, in the living room, like the entire house was packed with guitars. So you have a twenty foot container sitting in front of your suburban home. Yeah. I love this. Yeah, for about maybe four hours, unloaded it, and they came and took it away. And you know, from that moment on, I would I would just um, pull guitars out of the case, take a photograph, pop them up on the My Rare Guitars website because it was still My Rare Guitars, but all of a sudden there's this new brand called Eastwood. And about a year later, we we got we realized this is actually a business now. So what did the headstocks say on those original guitars? Um, they were, they all said Eastwood. Eastwood, okay. Because, for example, I didn't own the airline trademark. Okay. So right now there's probably about 64 guitars out there in the world that are airlines as you know them, but they all say Eastwood on the headstock because that, that was the very first run of them. So, yeah, those are, some, somebody might find that collectible. Yeah, it's, inter- it's just yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah, it's cool. Yeah, but then so so that that's kind of how the thing got rolling. Um, the ball got rolling. We ended up my rare guitars kind of evolved into being um, a, a a place to buy, sell, and trade weird used stuff, not just Eastwood, but we would take in trades and stuff like that. And then Eastwood, we developed the Eastwood website, which is huh. probably the tenth generation of it you see now, which is all on Shopify and everything now. But that's, that's how the thing got to where it was. And then but we didn't do a NAMM show or anything like that until about maybe 2006. So everything was direct to consumer off the website mm-hmm. and, and still out of Canada. So as, as, as the thing kind of evolved, we realized that it was really expensive shipping guitars from Canada to the United States because 90% of the business was the U.S. So we, we had to think about... Um, moving, um, moving the business there. And we ended up um, contracting in, let me see, would it be about, well, first we, first we opened up in, in Liverpool, UK, mm-hmm. well, with a, a customer of mine and yours, a guy named yep. Carl Cook. He, yep. was, he was a dealer for Reverend. Yep, I know Carl. And this would have been about 2007, 2008. Mm-hmm. And he ended up uh, operating Eastwood, UK. Okay. So containers would start going over there, and we can address the, the North America or the European market from there. And the North American market was still out of uh, out of Toronto. Um, but 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 the thing just kept growing. And you know, when we finally did the Nam show, we finally had a bunch of dealers. Like we were talking <coughs> earlier about Rudy yeah. um, signed up, um, the Chicago Music Exchange, um, True Tone Music, Santa Monica. So a bunch of dealers started picking them up because they'd kind of heard about them. And people were starting to come into the stores like, where do we get these Eastwoods? Or, There's only this website in Canada. Can't we get them here? And that, that's how that started picking up, picking up a little bit of uh, steam. Mm-hmm. Um, and then about 2008 or nine, just after the kind of stock market crash and things kind of Oh, yeah. Back, we had a good time around here then. Yeah. You could that probably, affect Canada at all? If, yeah. It affected everywhere. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, we met with a, a guy named Teddy Gordon who had a, has a, a music store in Chicago called Making Music. Yeah, Making Music, of course. Yeah. Is he still carrying all those fancy Tom Andersons? And, yes, uh, a lot of Fender Custom Shop stuff. I, was, yeah. I just spent the last two days with him uh, on my way here. Teddy's great. I've known Teddy for yeah, 15 super years, too. So um, we, we worked out a deal with him um, where we would then ship the, stop shipping the containers to Canada, okay. ship the container into his building in Chicago, and we subcontracted all the activity of setting up, shipping, and delivering, and fulfilling all the business okay. there. Okay. And uh, it, the, the thing continued to grow. So yeah. that, that was, that, um, that was kind of like 10 years into it. And it, and it's, it was just humming along great. A, uh, the next stage um, 
There's a, a couple of other key things I want to talk about. Dennis Fano is one. Sure. And, and the other thing, we came up with this idea called Eastwood Custom Shop, um, which mm. still goes today. Okay. And it's cool. Yeah. And the, I, like something like this, we'd come up with an idea like, hey, let's do a replica of a, in this particular example, a Sure Gold 6. Okay. And we would just take a picture of an original of it, put it up on the website and say, hey, if we can get 24 people to put in a $250 deposit, we'll go to production, and six months later, you'll get your guitar. This is a different story for this particular guitar, of but course, of course. that's how the whole system works. So we did all kinds of odd things. We did things like a, one of the best ones, one of my favorite ones, was a Devo. Um, the, the block of wood? The, yes, the LeBay 2x4. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are so smart. And I, people yeah. were asking me for years, you got to do that. You got to. I, I, I would look at it and go, who would that who would want to buy one of those? Devo is... You're, you're sitting in Ohio right now talking about Devo. Yeah. I just thought I'd share that with you. Yes. Yeah, Devo was a so thing. So <laughs> it surprised me. We took a picture of an original one, put it up there, and said, well, if we could sell 24 of these things at $5.99 on a $150 deposit, we'll... we'll you'll and, and then the day we announced it, the guy that runs the Devo fan page announced it to there. Yeah. We sold over 250 of them <laughs> in like three days. It was you didn't just, see that coming, did you? I did not see that coming. And that, that, that's where I kind of learned the power of um, fan base of, uh, yeah. of bands sure. and followers, yeah. which kind of brings up Peter Hook. Cause, so, um, so, so when you would do that, yeah. then how long would it take you to fulfill something like that? You would be looking at six months, eight months down yeah, the road? Yeah, typically, same, same for you. Like when you yeah. put an order in with the factories, four to six months, it's a little bit longer these days, six to eight months maybe, but you'd figure out what the numbers are that you need. You'd put in the purchase order. They'd, they'd schedule the production, and six weeks later, after the production is complete, the container shows up, and we fulfill all the orders. Did you, with this, I don't know. I, this is a this is a me question. I'm, I don't know if this would be interesting to everybody or not, but but I'm just I don't want to forget to ask you. So so when it came to doing some of these specific guitars, did you rely on the factories that you were having build them for all of the parts, soup to nuts, or did you have to like? Were there situations where you would have to supply very specific things? Like I I know when we work yeah. with artists. No, it's a good question. You know, we're we're supplying hip shot bridges for yeah. the Mike Watt base, and we're supplying um, you know uh, Sustaniac units for Reeves, yeah. and the different things that that we're doing. Some of the, some of which we install here, some of which we send yeah. to Mir in Korea, and that juggling all of that. So when you're talking about doing like a specific custom run for somebody, yeah. like this Shergold base, the speeder hook thing, the pickup is very unusual. Yeah. Is that something that you would expect the people that, that are making them to reproduce for you? This is a unique example where, where the answer to that is no. We had to go and, and subcontract a lot of these bits and pieces to get them to match the original. Okay. Back to the Devo version, and for, and for that matter, most of the weird, quirky 60s stuff we replicate, yeah. we're really, we're not, um, we're not making replicas. This is an exact replica, like right down to the detail of every little thing. Okay. I would say more, most of the stuff we do, I would rather use the word like tribute to. Okay. So Fair if enough. I can take a picture of a LeBay 2x4, which probably some very few people own an original would, would care anyways. If I can just t make a drawing of it, use generic humbuckers, generic pots and switches and tuners and everything, it's really the look that people want. Sure. They don't really care because the original was probably crap. Anyways, it, the, the one that we're making is generally better than the stuff from the, that was coming out of Japan in the 60s. So for, the, for a lot okay. of the stuff in the... The traditional Eastwood um, quirky stuff. No, we don't need to bother specking any of the parts. We, 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 it's better to use off-the-shelf standard parts so that if you want to upgrade your, your Devo 2x4, you can go put yeah, that Yeah, you can put in. EMGs in it or exactly. whatever people are going to do. Because people know. are going to do. Oh, but, <laughs> but they do. They do. And then you're like, wow, somebody did yes. that. Okay, cool. But so, that, But this one, like uh, Mark from Mojo Tone in UK. Yeah. He got, we got the original Shergold bass from Peter Hook. Okay, so tell, tell you, you told me this story a little bit yeah. um, before we went on today. And I'm not familiar even with Shergold. Yeah. So what is the story with Peter Hook and this bass then? Okay. And so, then leading to now, because it's yes. interesting, because Peter Hook is awesome. Shergold was uh, affiliated with Burns Guitars back in the 
early 70s. Okay. And Peter Hook just found one of these in a guitar store back in the day um, and started using it as part of the early Joy Division records. Pick it up a little bit. The original, yeah. Oh. So, some, so some, it, yeah. It's, it's a bass six. It's kind of a bass six. I don't know, it's kind of awkward. I don't want to knock over my coffee cup. But yeah. what the big difference is, is it, they, for some reason, Shergold at the time decided they were going to make a custom bridge okay. that was wide enough to feel like a bass. Okay. Whereas most basic Fender bass six, East, any Beastwood bass six is just a standard two pneumatic string spacing. Yeah, so they're very is, close. Yeah. So you'd play chords on a bass six. But this thing is designed more like a bass. And that's why when you listen to Joy Division and what Peter Hook does, he's... He's rarely strumming a chord. He's picking out um, harmonic notes and, and octave, messing around with the octaves and stuff like that, which made it kind of unique because it sounded like, it sounded like a bass player playing guitar, or a guitar player playing bass. Sure. And, and that's what kind of was all part of that music. The pickup itself was unique too. So, Peter was specific though. Like like I was saying earlier about most of the Eastwood stuff. People look at it and they, they, they want to have a tribute to. Peter is very specific. The, the neck profile, that every last little detail, he wanted to be like his originals. Because at the time, uh, he was having a hard time finding backup bass sixes to go on tour. Back in the day with Joy Division New Order. So he, he found three or four of them. I'm not sure what the number is. But when we finally got the prototype to him, he immediately left his other stuff behind and took it out on, on tour in the U.S. that year. And he used it exclusively on, on tour uh, with that. Since then, um, we went back. He has another model called the uh, Viking. Okay. And uh, we've done the same thing with the Viking. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's going gonna, it's gonna to attract a, a bass crowd all its own because it's not just specific to New Order and, and Hooky, although it's, it's a replica of his bass. Um, How well it, do you have to know him before you can start calling him Hooky? I, I think, I think you, this if is you met him right point. now, he yeah. would prefer you call him Hooky. Okay. All right. I said I was going to ask the hard questions. Well, so. you know, and then that's, that's one of the um, <laughs> connections that we have, Reverend in Eastwood, yeah. is his son, right. Jack, plays with Smashing Pumpkins yeah. when he's not touring with Peter Hook. Yeah. And, and Jack was uh, instrumental yeah. in working with Carl Cook on... Jack, Jack is an incredible bass player. Yeah, yeah. And a, I mean, and, like his dad, eh? and a great guy, and he understands um, he understands what you know what we're trying to accomplish, what they're trying to accomplish, and he's he was kind of the glue that made this whole thing happen with Carl. Yeah. So it's uh, it's it's just a it's a it's a great relationship. We've got we've done a copy of a six string um, Shergold Raider as well, which is the one that um, Bernard used in the in the New Order Joy Division days. So that one's available. We've got another one coming out, which is basically a shorter scale version of this, leans a little bit more towards guitars. So, so the hooky the hooky line is developing into a, a, a brand fan. all of its own. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you're a fan, huge fan. Yeah, I mean, you can tell huge by how excited. It's, uh, listening to you talk about it is like listening to me talk about like reefs. Yeah. You know, because you're just like, oh wow, you know, like it's it's really really fun to work with your heroes. Yes. Like it becomes So a, there's another good yeah. one. Reeves um, Reeves d does has done and done some work with Bill Nelson who's yeah. I'm I'm the world's biggest Bill Nelson fan. Yeah. And we've done a bunch of Bill Nelson signature gu guitars as well. And they've they worked together. So there there's are, there's some interesting connections with with Reverend and Eastwood that, yeah. that when we look at our, our fan pages or not our fan pages are the bands that we support they're they're completely different. It's probably because you're 10 years younger than me and I have my set of bands that I grew up yeah. with and you have your set of bands that you grew up with. Yeah. But um, And the, I work with a lot of bands that are 30 years younger than me, which yeah. is awesome because it makes me feel like I'm in touch with something, but it's also jarring. Yeah. Because a lot of times, I, like I will notice on our fan pages, we'll be, caring, we'll be sharing current stuff that we're doing with young people and guys my age or older will be like, I don't understand why you're doing this. Like, I get all these weird emails, and it's like, well, it's a big world out there, yeah. you know. And there's there's a lot of stuff going on, and it, and it's it's fun to be involved in all of it. It is. So so, what are some of our other? I mean, because I was trying to, I was think. Well, I I have other questions for you, but 
you open this door. So what brings you here today? Like, where did you and I, you and I first met at maybe the Dallas International Guitar Festival? Is that where we first that started have, talking? That, that might have been, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that was some time ago. Jimmy and Wallace. I mean, we obviously, we know a lot of mutual people. I mean, all yep. those dealers that you rattled off earlier are yep. all Reverend dealers. And, and so we obviously have seen each other's stuff around this entire time. Sure. The companies are roughly the same age. Yep. Naylor, Naylor did Naylor Amps in the early 90s, but he did the first Reverend drawings in 96 and put the first guitars out in 97. Yep. And I started doing shows with him pretty close, 99, I think. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the companies kind of grew. Yep. Together, and so we would see each other around a lot, but I think it was at a Dallas show that you and I sat down, and um, I don't remember if we were discussing red wine in particular, or... <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about well, wine other than dinner, how to drink it. We had it. dinner, uh, Penny was there, it was, yeah. it was uh, Carl, I think Carl was probably there. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I, and, and, and that connection with Carl in, uh, in the UK when he was a dealer of yours too, there was... There's been some synergy, but the nice thing I've always thought is, is I don't feel like we're not we don't compete. We have we have a slightly different audience, um, slightly different customer base. There's there's a certain amount of overlap, but from a business standpoint, I, I like getting together with you talk because that's the fun part of talking about what it is that we do. Yeah, and absolutely. And, and just to kind of compare ideas and kind of think yeah. through, yeah. Um, just just to kind of see that we're all on the right track and things are working out well. That, that's that's the fun part for me. Back, back in the day when I used to sell paint, everybody, everybody in this area used product from R&M because they're from down the street, they're mm -hmm. from Waterhouse. Waterville? Waterville. White House and Waterville, thanks. Um, they're right down the road. And, and so all, all, the, all the shops in this area all use that product. And all the shops in the Detroit area use PPG. And my boss back then used to tell me, like, because we would see, if you would go to, to, a, to a place and you would see them using an alternative brand, then the light bulb would go off. You'd be like, oh, well, they're already into, they're already into looking at different stuff. You yeah. know? So we should be able to do something here. And my boss at that time would always tell me, if you can develop a relationship with one of these PPG or R&M accounts yep. and you can get them to start buying product from you, you will have a lifelong relationship with that customer yep. because they obviously like you and believe in what you're doing in order sure. to go away from something that's so ingrained in them. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, those companies have 90% of the business. Are you seeing the correlation that I'm making here? Yeah. Because brands that we compete against are just... Two or three major brands, yeah, you know, and and they've been around forever. They've been around since there was they created this industry. Yes, you know, and they're yep. still here, and that's great. And and there is enough, there is enough of that business for us to piecemeal that we don't need to we don't need to go after each other. It's it's you know it, it is a funny yeah. business because we do yeah. all know each other. Yep, and we pretty much all get along yeah i get along with the product guy offender great he's a good yeah. friend of ours yeah we all help each other out too because it, yeah. it's, uh, it's of course. just that type of that's one thing i love about this industry compared to the software business it was it was aggressive yeah very very aggressive and high stakes and um i don't miss it at all i don't i don't uh, i don't lose sleep over it it's just it, this stuff is way more fun it yeah. doesn't feel like work yeah Sometimes it does, but well, most part, most part, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, there's there's some things, of course, that feel like work, but there are things that come along with any business, for sure. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and we're not we're not necessarily looking for. Um, guitar players like to have multiple guitars. Yeah. I know I do. <laughs> yes. You know, because I get asked the Ibanez question all the time, like, "No, I saw a picture of you while playing Ibanez." I don't normally gig out and not, my guitars, Reverend guitars, Joe's designs are my favorites. Yeah. And they're always going to be. That's the what drew me here to begin with. Yeah. And that's what I'm here doing. But I still like other brands of guitars. I still collect other brands of guitars. Um, I have a lot of stuff, whatever. Um, and guitar players are like that. Yeah. You know, it's very rarely that you have the guy that has one guitar and that's the one. Well, I'm never...
you're going to buy yeah. another one. I yeah, mean, no guitar way. guys get hooked. And, they do. I mean, and you've built a business. The, one of the neat things that you've done is you've addressed that collector itch in guitar players in a very unique way by giving yeah. somebody something that's very, very affordable. Yeah. And then they can tinker with you know, guitars, yeah. like you said. A lot of sure. those guitars that were made in the 60s are basically unplayable. And they're really, really fun to look at. But in a modern in a modern sense, the way people play guitar now, yeah. bending notes <laughs> and things of that nature, all of these guitars when 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 a lot of the guitars that that you you do your tribute mm -hmm. models of, when those guitars were made, there weren't light strings. No, they, everything was getting fourteen through sixty gauge yes. strings. Yeah, it's hard to play. Put on them, wrestling round thirds. with them all the time. Yeah, it was, it was. But the, but the, but those heavy strings are a lot more. For, I mean, in a technical aspect, yeah. they're a lot more forgiving. They're a lot more forgiving intonation wise on yeah. instruments. You know, um, because they don't pull as sharp if the action is high. And then people were just courting with them anyway. So if they if the guitar is intonated in the first five or six frets, you could. Yeah. You play those guitars it. out. They were cool. You know, they were cool and fun to look at. And it's as we got more technical about things that left a lot of those guitars behind as far as playability yeah. is concerned. Um, and so what you've done is cool because you've made this thing where you're like an old, an old airline or an old Tysco or an yeah. old Harmony Retro Rocket or something, even things that in the 90s had, you could go buy them for $125, yeah. as you know. Now sell for a couple thousand yeah. as art you know yeah uh, i saw airline hanging in the boston museum with my son um a couple months ago they had a musical instrument section yep. and there was a 65 uh like sort of a surf green and white yep. airline i don't know what model it was but in the museum and that's what people do with yeah. that and then you there you have this sort of playable version of that yeah. that a guy can put humbuckers in or do whatever he wants with and and I, he's not destroying the vintage integrity of true. this artwork. Yeah. Cool. I, I, I find a lot of our products that we develop to are, are are there's a certain element of impulse buying when it comes to guitar players. When they just see something they go, "No, I got to have that." <laughs> and and there's, there's a lot of catch and release that goes on too. <laughs> Like you satisfy <laughs> that impulse, you go, oh, I got it, and then they get it, and then three weeks later, you go, oh, I, I want that one now, and they gotta, they gotta move that on. But you're right. Some people end up with five, ten, fifteen, twenty guitars. I know that I've been, I've been, <laughs> I'm ten years older than you, so I've been thinning the herd lately because it's just the collect, the collecting part. Um, I'm starting to enjoy the release part more than the catch part. <laughs> Same with amps too, although I do have a new amp in my. And two guitars in my car that see, I'm bringing back from see. Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course you do. I, I took in a I took in a Princeton amp on a trade, maybe six months ago <laughs> that I'd forgotten about because it got shipped and dropped off at Teddy's in Chicago. Okay. And I was there two days ago, and I'm driving through, and he says, "Do you want that amp?" And I, I'm like, "What amp? That Princeton amp?" And I'm thinking, "Oh yeah, the Princeton amp." And I had to make room in the car to. Hopefully the customs guys aren't watching me. Like I'm going to be crossing the border in about five hours. You can leave it here. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's it's uh, it is it, it's a fun. That's a fun part of the business. Is yeah. that kind of always kind of seeking out, finding something new and yeah. Okay. We talk about Dennis. So yeah, yeah, that's um that's where I'm going next um, yeah. too. I wanted so who is Dennis Fano? Yeah. And why do we care? Yep. And what what is it that you do with him? Okay, so Dennis Fano. Um, Started a company called Fano Guitars. I'm I'm guessing 20 years ago, and he he he's most of you out there know who he is. But just to summarize yeah, that, he is he has gotten the reputation probably the number one kind of custom guitar, guitar builder in the United States. In the United States, makes from scratch guitars uh, in the U.S. Are we going back again? I got to do this again. How is it? Is it working? Say something. Hello, hello. Kinda, kinda. What is going on? The mic part of that. Making us look bad. What do you think? Hello, hello, hello. Back? It's working now. It's working now. I unplugged right, it, plugged I'll it back in. All right. I'll start with Dennis again. Dennis again. So Dennis, um, custom guitar builder. Mm -hmm. He now runs a company called Novo Guitars out of Nashville. And they are um, 
arguably just the best custom built guitar out there. Um, and they're in that kind of four thousand to five thousand dollar price range, but they're spectacular. People love them. He can't, he can't make them fast enough, um, and he's growing that business substantially. About eight, eight years ago, I think I got together with him and I said to him, "Listen, Dennis, I've, I've figured out everything else in the guitar business, you know, production, manufacturing, sales, marketing, distribution, but design." Um, I'm just copying other people's stuff from the 60s. Yeah. I love your stuff. Why don't we partner and create a new brand? You name the brand, you come up with the designs, I'll take care of everything else and we'll start a new business. And that's how uh, Revolta Guitars was born. About, we first production was probably six or seven years ago. Okay. That thing is, is grown substantially. The, the initial idea was it that he could I could supplement his income with some regular cash flow by doing offshore manufacturing and at Mir, where you make your guitars, mm -hmm. and he was making. So we're making all the Revolta guitars there. Um, it's now, I I don't even know what the number is, but there's got to be at least 16 different models, lots of different flavors, worldwide distribution with dealers um, uh, over in UK and Europe. Dealers in North America, you can buy them direct from us as well. But the quality and the, the when you look at a Revolta guitar, you just know it's Dennis. And, and this is a brand new model, Dual Kata. Um, this just this was just released this week. In fact, if you go to YouTube, I think RJ, RJ, yeah, RJ, yeah. the main man, right? Uh, he he just has published um, videos on this model and that model. This is the junior over here. Um, just today, I think just this morning at 10 o'clock he released those. You can go check out those videos. But the guitars are just so well thought out. He's, he's, um, Dennis has a knack of creating something brand new that has, is somewhat re reminiscent of something historically, but it's got, it, it covers all the bases of like what real professional guitar players want in a guitar. And, and the quality is uh, spectacular. Um, so you can go to the website and check out all the different Revolta models, but he is um, he has an attention to detail that just uh, it, it takes it to another level that I just don't even I can't even comprehend. Yeah, they they look nice. We we un, we unpacked them. He, he got he sent these to us a couple of days ago, so mm -hmm. we got to we got to pass them around a little bit. So now your current production is coming out of Indonesia. This on the this back of the particular shot. model is Indonesia. And All the others and are coming out of world music, which world is, music in yeah, Korea. Yeah, and um, and what do you think? I, I think they look good. Oh, I think they're fantastic. I, I think it's funny. I think I think it's funny how much time um, how how a lot of uh, our competitors, for lack of a better term, but people try to downplay what they're doing, what their business model is. Yeah. You know, and I've always leaned into it. I don't have anything to hide from anybody. Yeah. And it's it's interesting that um, a lot of manufacturing is moving to Indonesia and China is kind of getting skipped over now. Now, I know you've yes. historically done a lot of business with China. We never have. Um, but what's happening in Indonesia that, that seems to be pretty interesting to me is that um, you seem to be able to get all range of quality. Yeah. I mean, whatever you're looking for there, if you, get, if you look at... These, you look at some of the PRS SE stuff. Yeah. Um, a lot of the guitars that are coming out of Indonesia right now are fantastic. Part so, this is one of those things where I, tr I try to remind the consumer about yeah. is you really have to look at what, what is important to the company that you're buying from. Yep. Because if, if price point is what's important to you, you can find a $400. Dollar five hundred dollar guitar yeah. out there. That's okay. Yeah, you know what I mean. But if you're really if you're really looking for features and things, you it's time to start taking the country of origin out of the equation. Out of yeah. the equation yeah. You know because there are there's we Reverend and then and some of the the um, Revolta stuff from before you went to World. We we have a very specific set of things that we expect because of the way our guitars are manufactured. Yeah. Everything's done on pin routers, it's done by hand, there's there's not CNC machine 
stuff. So there are inconsistencies sometimes between models, yeah. but there's things that we live with because the guitars are made by hand. Yeah. You can specify that kind of product from Indonesia or from India now, yeah. from things of that nature. People will, be, but you have right. to pay more to, to get that. But then you're getting a product that's consistent with what was done here in the U.S. 60 years ago yeah. and what's being done in Korea now. And then you can also get this like precision level CNC manufacturing yeah. that, that opens up doors to different things too. So you, it, it's very important to take, take each guitar and each manufacturer as it is and not put sort of a blanket state. No. Well, th this is made here, so it's great. I mean, that... Part of the issue I'm, I'm finding, and you, you're seeing the same thing for sure, is that the, the reason that why there's a, a move from um, Korea to Indonesia is the workforce in Korea is diminishing. Like the available number of people to go work at Mir, at World Music, at all these factories, it's really hard to find employees. Yeah. And um, I mean, you've talked to the guys over at Mir, and the, the, the workforce is aging. And the young people coming out of universities don't want to go work at a guitar factory. They, they, would, they, they want to go work at a, a, a video game development. They, they want to get into computers and stuff like right. that. Of course. So that's exactly what's happening. And, and the, 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 the available volume of guitars at some of these Korean factories is, is slowly diminishing. Yeah. And that's why, um, yet at the same time, I'm having the problem with China is their workforces are turning over every eight months. So you got a brand new guy learning how to paint, learning how to sand, learning how... So the quality issues out of China are a constant struggle. Interesting. These guys, these guys... Now, the price point of the costing of these things are twice China, but lower than Korea. So these guys have kind of got a sophisticated workforce who understand how to level frets, how to paint, how to do all that stuff. Interesting. And, and you kind of have to... You kind of have to move move the the what it is you're trying to accomplish are that. you trying to accomplish a player professional player grade uh, guitar then you got to go to indonesia or korea or if you want to pay up and get them handmade by dennis fano in the united states and, and if you pay 4500 bucks for dennis you get your money's worth you absolutely do but this like this one on the ends 9.99 I, I think this is 12.99 or 13 some somewhere in that price range yeah but um the value for, for that is just, yeah. it's fantastic. Joe, Joe has said for years, company of origin as opposed to country of origin. Yeah. You know, you really have to look at what, what's important to you and yeah. what you try to do. And I try to be as transparent about this stuff as possible because yeah. to me, it's just better business to just say, you know, look, this is what, this is yeah, what that's you're why getting. we're all putting this in the is back of the head stock exactly what it is and who made it and where it's from. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. I, I like the wording of that. Yeah. I had quite a giggle. <laughs> Because it's exactly like ours. <laughs> well, like we always share good ideas. Right, we all share good ideas. That's right. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, no, it, but Paul's doing that now, too. Yeah. And I mean, I, I'm, I'm seeing that more and more. And it isn't necessarily about, about us. Um, it's more consumer education than it is about... about yeah. I, I saw somebody online the other day say, say that um, as manufacturers, we're trying to hold... Our factories accountable for for quality issues and stuff like that. I mean, I, I guess to a certain point, but that's never changed. We always yeah. try to do that, but we have to accept responsibility for what sure. what we're producing and putting out there. Yep. You know, and uh, and it's just part of of consumer education. I mean, I yep. want people to know. I want people to know what it is that we do. Yep. You know, and and we spend a lot of time here. You know, as you've seen, setting up guitars and working on guitars and making sure they're playable, you know, as soon as they go out the door. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not going to go to a dealer whose junior tech is, and feels like he has to set up everything that comes yeah. through the door. And then they screw up all of our great work. That happens. And then we just, we deal with it. You know what I mean? And, and, uh, and yeah. we always come back around and try to take care of the customers because ultimately we just want to make the customers happy. And... Um, so yeah, yeah it's, it's of, an interesting business, and it, and the, the model the, is changing. The big difference with ours, and that we have so many different SKUs and so many different touch Levels. points, yeah. and yeah. mando casters and mandolins and, and and mandolas and tenors. We've got we've got twenty four different tenor models, yeah. and, and so but you know, it, I have to start out by thinking, 
what's what's the price point for this tenor? Yeah. Is somebody going to give me fifteen hundred dollars? Which this has got to be, or is or or six ninety nine the, the right price? And as soon as you make that decision, then your choice is only going to China. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and then but, but you know doesn't say we we can't do a fifteen hundred dollar tenor. You just sell you'd sell twenty at six ninety nine. Than you would for every one you sell at fifteen hundred. So, yeah, depending what the instrument and what what the what its intended future use is. Because if, if you were if you, back, back to the guitar player that has ten guitars. Yeah. He probably has a baritone and a twelve string, and eight guitars. So it, he yeah. uses the twelve string um, from time to time. So seven ninety nine might be the budget for that. He doesn't need to spend as much as he does on his everyday guitar. So that's, that's part of the thing I'm always trying to um, sort out in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. See, we do that. It's funny that you even call out the 12 string. No, it's, I'm going to throw that mic straight in the trash. We're Are we? Yeah. Okay. Time to get a new one? We'll call our friends at Sure. Um, it's funny because I take the completely opposite approach to that. So we make a 12 string, but we make like... We make a professional player grade 12 string that you can intonate, that stays in tune, locking tuner, spruce top, yep. the whole nine yards. Because in the 12 string market, there's everything is the same. There's 699, 799 yep. 12 strings that are made to fulfill that need and be affordable. Yep. But then there's $4,000 12 strings that don't play or stay in tune any better than the $700 ones because they weren't. They weren't thought all the way through. That's just yeah. like, well, we're going to put twelve strings on a on whatever this you know semi hollow that we've been making for years, and yeah. we're just going to call this twelve string. So you end up with all sorts of inherent issues with those things, or like the Strat twelve or whatever. And so Joe has figured out a way to fix all the issues with the traditional twelve string, yeah. and then the customer base that we go after are people who play twelve strings for a yeah. living. You know, yeah, like somebody's going to go out on the Decemberists. On... Yeah, sure. 60% of his songs are on a 12, and yeah. he's playing our guitar out with those guys every night or whatever. And, uh, and, and we, have, so we have weird, we have 12 string endorsers, you know? And so we're making something to sort of fill that hole that's been yeah. left. And, I, and Naylor, Naylor and I look for that and go after that all the time and try to sort of plug that thing, knowing that we're not going to sell hundreds of them a month. We don't. Yeah. But that, our, our 12 string is always in our top five SKUs. It's always on backward. It's an interesting. It's an interesting niche that we've yeah. made, but that's Joe. You know, over engineering it, which is what he does, which is perfect. Yeah. Which it needed to be done. You know. Wow. We just went on and on and on. Before we, well, I'm going to try to take a couple of questions, um, but before I do, um, talk to me about the. This is just personal. Mm -hmm. you know, pretending the camera's not even here. Talk to me about the uh, Tysco Spectrum Five. I just absolutely, I am completely fascinated with yeah. that guitar. And then I went kind of, I, I thought that I was, <laughs> I had this idea that I was going to buy one of the five that were in the Knopfler option. No. And yeah. I actually bid on one like an idiot. And then they sold for like $30,000 yeah. because they were Knopflers. And, but they were, they were all originals and they were set up to play. And he used them on some specific things, which sure. was really cool. Most of the original ones aren't set up to play. The ones we made with, with Mir were fantastic. Yeah. Unfortunately, about two years ago, um, they lost the supplier for a, a certain parts that were available on that, so we had to stop making them. I, don't, I can't get them anymore. Huh. But that's a good... I should bring them up with them. We can bring that back to life, because I know they still supplied a few, to, a few Japanese yeah. um, people. But yeah, that's the coolest guitar. It really is, yeah. yeah. And, and how many of these, like, trademarks do you own from these old instruments? I mean, what were you, as, as it started to grow and you started to get more involved in the business end, yeah. did you just start collecting these trademarks? Like, yeah, yeah, the ones that I've, I, would, I would start making something, wait a while, if no cease and desist letters came, which I have a file folder in my desk, massive file folder. Um, I would have, and I would see that there's a viable business that you want to protect, which is the only reason you want to get a trademark. Sure. Then I would go get the airline trademark, and I'd go get, like, I have a Vondre trademark, believe it or not, because we, 
we're one of the only guys that make that thing. So we have a number of trademarks that are ones that are worth protecting. Other ones, other ones you just, you just, for example, airline, back in the day, um, airline and Harmony made the exact same guitars that were of course. Through, so we just, we make every Harmony guitar you've ever seen, but it's just branded airline because I don't own the Harmony trademark. And sure. you can't call it Harmony, so or right. Stratotone, another one. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, but we uh, trademarks are a, a, a an annoying necessity. Yeah, yeah. But apart from that, you know, it's uh, I've learned how to deal with cease and desist letters. <laughs> I've gotten very good at it <laughs> because that's kind of the, what the businesses we're in. But most of the stuff yeah. we make. Are, co are replicas of things of companies that went out of business it's, in the 60s. Yeah, right, right. So, yeah. Yeah, there's no... Yeah. Interesting. John, I know we have been going... We've been doing this for 50 minutes or so, which is crazy. But it's interesting. It's interesting to me. I hope it's interesting to you guys. You know, this lives on on the interweb after all yes. of this. This lives on I could overdub on our, all the... I could redo all the vocal yeah, parts. Yeah, the, this will be on uh, on our YouTube channel. Yeah. Uh, in perpetuity. Cool. So, um, do we have questions that we can take? I, <clears throat> and my my first question is, how many questions do we have from Johnny Cola? <laughs> <laughs> Johnny, Johnny's been uh, active. On yeah. Things. Not a lot of questions, a lot of comments, uh, a lot of chatter about uh, the earthquake that hit the East Coast for some reason. What? What? There was a tiny earthquake. Oh, okay. Uh, but you guys, you literally just kind of covered this. But Johnny asked. When you do a tribute custom, do you need to contact the owner of the name to do it, like the new Robin style guitar? Yes. So there's a there's a cease and desist letter, a recent one. Uh, the answer to that is the trade trademarks are usually name wise, so we can't call it a Robin guitar because the Robin name itself is trademark. But the body shape, headstock shape, anything about the guitar itself is not patented or trademarked. Fender. Gibson, these level of guys, they, they've got, you can't do that headstock because they have a trade, trade dress on the headstock. Um, so not only can you not say Fender or Gibson, you can't do their body shapes or headstock shapes, but the, as far as um, names are really the issue. That's why you'll see Eastwood on the headstock of that, that model. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, Mark Adam. Hi, Mark. Wants to know when more Mach 2s will be available. I'm imminently if not if not already but yeah they're on order and we should have a bunch of them any day now what's a mock dude it's the ramones oh of course the ramones Duh. most right i knew it sounded familiar yeah. yeah 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 cool very cool uh most of that's just comments about how they like their eastwoods and their supros no oh, very cool they like them yeah excellent i like See, them too I knew this would be interesting. <laughs> well, I come back through here every six months. Yeah. So or, we could do this or again. More. Sure, we could. Yeah. I'll bring my own. Because we have so we have dinner every six months or so when you yeah, come through here. Yeah. Yeah. We should just film that because that's a good laugh too. <laughs> There's all kinds of interesting information. I got, I got one yeah. more uh, question came in. Okay. Okay. Uh, David Limpf won an airline map from Premier Guitar Premier Guitar many years ago. Oh. Wants to know if he can put the soft touch reverence spring in the Bigsby. Yes. See why not? Should yes, you can. There's yeah, that'll collaborative drop. product. That'll drop right in there. Yeah. You gave me some of those, and they're cool. Yeah, they're cool. They work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they definitely work. We're starting to we're starting to get some OEM business on those too here oh, yeah. and there. So, a little bit, little bits of it. But it's not really a Bigsby spring. It's just a soft touch spring. Should so. we? Um, do another hour of show, like pick up guitars and you can play drums and we'll just rock out in here in the studio. I mean, it's that such a great like studio. It. Yeah. You guys can't see what's, what we're looking at. Well, actually, you've probably seen it when the bands are playing live. It's a really cool setup. Yeah, so we don't really live stream the bands, but we record the bands oh, here okay. and then we, we, we spend a, a good amount of time. Uh, because you're using multi-cameras? you want to Yes, yeah. putting together the shoot and, and mixing. Yeah. Uh, properly, and if you're hanging on to this, if you haven't seen the Coffin Cats video yet, uh, it's a must. They destroyed. Well, they, they played in here like they were playing in front of an arena, yeah. and uh, absolutely laid out some great shit. And so that is that is online now. And then uh, next 
I'm very excited next Friday to launch the first video. Um, we recorded Sir Chloe in here a few weeks ago, which if they have rapidly become one of my favorite bands. And so it, again, there's like this, there's this fanboy thing, yeah, right, that I do, and maybe a little bit too much, but I don't, I'm into it. Yeah, you know, well, that's part it, of the it, fun it's, of the business, right? And yeah. it's so much fun to meet these young bands that are doing this really yeah. interesting. There are so many bands doing really interesting things now yeah. uh, that are fantastic. Also, I discovered online yesterday, and I guess it's been up for a while, but I'm the last. If something is happening on the internet, guaranteed, I'm the last to know. <laughs> unless, <laughs> unless I'm live on the internet like I am right now, and yeah. John tells me there's an earthquake, then I might. Be, yes. But other than that, things that are happening on the internet, I'm the last to know. Apparently, somebody filmed the entire Hot Mulligan set from our NAM party. There you uh, go. Or our NAM show. We brought Hot Mulligan into the... And uh, it's on YouTube? The Hilton. Yeah. <laughs> which was ill-fated and absolutely awesome. Super great set. And apparently, somebody posted the whole set on the interwebs. Well, I still, so you should check I, that out, too. I still love going to see live bands. My, my wife and I, went, we're in Arizona for the winter. We drove from Mesa down to Tucson. You are old. To see the Buzzcocks. Yeah. And the band is older than us. Wow. But it, it was just, it was fantastic. Yeah. And I just love that stuff. Oh, we it were talking about old. this. I, the, last week, sitting right where you're sitting, we had uh, Will from Adam Ant, the yeah. lead guitar player in his band. And I went and saw Adam Ant last weekend, and it, and it was amazing. And that tour is going on across the states for the next five or six weeks. And listen, y'all, go see Adam Ant. He brings it. He brings it. And his band, two drummers, the guitar players, I gotta go see are both there. amazing. It is, it is. They've so probably good. already done Toronto then, if they've, if they were here. I don't know. I'll look. I, yeah, I'm, I'm horrible with schedule. The, but I can't keep track. Of I, all I got shit Matthew Sweet on. coming in Toronto. I'm a big Matthew Sweet That's, fan. He's there in two weeks, I he, think. Yeah, he has a Club King. He bought from us, yeah. maybe ten years ago. I think or he's so. using nothing but Novos now. Good for him. Yeah, he's a very nice. He was a really nice guy. Super. It's great tunes. Anyhow, anyhow, lots of music. Mike, thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate. It. Uh, what do we have coming up? That's a good question. No, uh, next Friday, um, I am going to have uh, Jamie and Julie from Earthquaker Devices. What my thing fell? No, I'm showing. Oh, he's got his Earthquaker shirt. I'm like, I can show you my bad time <laughs> record shirt. Uh, yeah, uh, you're gonna have to make sure get that laundered and have it on again next Friday. Um, and uh, Jamie. Uh, Jamie is obviously expecting to sit on the couch and get the questions, but uh, I don't know if Julie is. And if Julie's watching right now, she should know that she's in the hot seat as well. Because uh, she, she has really been instrumental in the phenomenal growth that Earthquaker Devices has had. And um, I'm, I just, there are so many women kicking ass in this industry right now, and it's, and it's fun to, it was fun for me to have Jen from Soldier here, who is yeah. taking her business in all kinds of new different directions. And it'll be fun to have uh, Jamie here to talk about pedals and Julie here to talk about business. So I'm really looking forward uh, to the show next week as well. And then uh, after that, I, uh, two weeks from this weekend, will be at the This Is Not Croydon Festival north of Philadelphia. Jane Navarro and the Traders are playing on Saturday. But uh, Reverend Endorsers, We Are the Union, The Suicide Machines, The Toasters. Uh, we have, uh, I think we have You're six busy or boy. I think we have six or seven bands on that oh, festival. Cool. So I am going to, uh, I'm going to set up guitars and uh, hang out in the merch area for the weekend. Because I have, with, with all my ska buds. And then uh, I'll be home for a week. And then it's off to the Dallas International Guitar Festival. And I know Penny and I are planning on taking about... 40, 50 guitars down there like we usually do. And uh, that's going to be a banging show this year. Um, Reverend is sponsoring the clinician stage, the indoor stage, and Greg and I will be doing clinics uh, Saturday and Sunday afternoon. And that's the first weekend in May. Cool. So, and Midwest people, enjoy the eclipse. And I will see you here next Friday with Earthquaker. Reverend out. Oh, wait. David Letterman style. <laughs> <laughs>